Are you ready for the word this morning? I went to an ID exchange two weeks ago. Men and women from all over the country, all over the world actually was gathered sharing ideas about where the church is today in 2014. Where are we going? Where's the church going? And then the last couple of days we had the opportunity to be in T.D. Jake's conference in Orlando sharing some powerful things. He's got some tremendous insight. He has revelation from the Lord that's unbelievable how he tunes in to God's voice. Let me share a couple of thoughts that came out of that conference and a scripture with you and then I'm going to share some things I believe that will make a difference this morning. Buckle up your seat belts and clear your minds and shake off any heaviness and don't worry about what's going to happen after the service. Let's get into the Spirit of God during the service. Amen. Amen. Cell phones off and no texting and Amen. Hallelujah. We're here, to, we're here to tune in to God, not to find out what, who sent that last email that just vibrated. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Glory to God. We're on the same page. How many of you, how many of you remember, now some of you may not be able to remember this because you're kind of young, but I remember back in the days when I learned to drive a stick shift. Okay, nowadays, I'm not even going to ask for raise hands how many of you don't know what I'm talking about, or how many of you don't know how to drive a stick shift. I don't want you to raise your hand. In case, in case you wonder, a stick shift is something that's got like that on the shifting knob. Does that look familiar to anybody? Okay. Well, it's different than the ones I learned to drive with. I learned it. That's right. It had three forward gears and one reverse. Now you got five. Yeah, my old 52 Army Jeep had a little stick on there. Of course, it was four-wheel drive, but it, and it it wouldn't go any faster than 50 miles an hour wide open when you was in high gear. Now we got what's called overdrive. Now we got fourth and fifth gear. And a lot of people drive, learn how to drive a stick shift now by watching the tachometer. If you shift at about 2,200 RPM, it's about the right time to shift. But back in the days, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we didn't have tachometers. We had to shift Driving a stiff stick shift, we had to shift by knowing the sound of the motor. Is anybody with me? When the motor's revving real high and you're not going too fast, it's a good sign. Now, I found out, even driving my automatics, that sometimes that if I pull it past driving down into second or third on my automatic, I'll be driving along with the engine running pretty fast, too, and I'm not going too fast. And I look and say, oh, I'm not in drive. I'll push it up. Has that ever happened to anybody besides me? So when we learned how to drive the stick shift, we had to hear the sound of the motor. T.D. Jakes was sharing this, so I'm going to share it with you. That many of us in the church today, in fact, the church world today, might be stuck in first gear. Is anybody hearing me? <clears throat> We're doing the same things. We're going through the same motions. We're doing the same thing that we always done. We're trying to figure out why the church is not moving along and why the congregation is not growing because we're, we're in first gear. And if we're going to shift, the church is going to shift, and we as people is going to shift into second gear, we're going to have to hear the sound of God. To shift in the second gear with that old stick shift, I had to know the sound of the motor. 
How many of you know Jesus should be the driving force? The Holy Ghost ought to be the driving force that tells us when to shift. I'm going to read some scripture to you out of Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 through 9. And I think it's time us to recognize when to shift. I got some statistics for you that might shock you this morning. So I don't want you to miss it. The people that we think should be coming to church aren't even involved in church today. The ones that have been going to church until they're old enough to go do what they want to do, they leave the church and they don't come back. Churches are emptying out, folks. Anybody noticed? The churches, the churches are not having the people come that used to. And there needs to be a shift. We need to find out what are we going to do to bring, get, bring them back in. Can I hear an amen? amen? How many of you have somebody in your family? <clears throat> now, if I said how many of you got somebody in your family needs to be saved, about everybody raise their hand. I'm not asking that. How many of you have somebody in your family that used to be involved in church, but they're not anymore? Are you all looking around? You see the hands are up? Why aren't they? Amen? Is that a good question? How many of you would like us to come up with some answers, not only to find out why they're not in church anymore, but what, what are we going to do to get them back in? How many of you think that would be a good topic to, to look at because you just raised your hand, and I'm sure that you're concerned about your children and your aunts and your uncles and moms and dads and loved ones that used to be in the house of God. They used to be excited about church, but they're not involved anymore. Am I right? I'm going to read some Old Testament scriptures, Ezekiel chapter 47. This is a revelation. If you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that's a pretty heavy book. If you read the book of Ezekiel, just about every chapter, the Spirit of the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, stand that I might speak to you. God is wanting to speak to us today like he did to the prophets. He spoke to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 47, verse 1. Then he brought me back into the door of the temple. Now, I want you to try to get the picture. This is, a, this is like having a dream. This is like having a revelation, or this is like having a vision, and you have to put the vision together. First of all, this is taking place in the temple. How many of you know the temple is the house of God? It's all right if we get into something that has some, has some weight, into a, a weightier thing this morning. Can you stay with me? Do we got any believers here that say, Pastor, go for it. I want to I want to press in. I want to press in. I want to press in. All right. You see, if we're too shallow, I'll just go ahead and, you know, uh, tell you that Jesus loves you and that, uh, uh, and, and that uh, uh, if you're saved, you're going to heaven. And, and we can just all go home and say, oh, the Pastor was so sweet this morning. But if you want to hear something that's going to change your life, you've got to have ears to hear. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east, and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. Verse 2. He brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faced east, and there was water running out of the right side. I, I highlighted that. And there was water running out of the right side. Well, there was water uh, r running out of, the, uh, out of the right side. Then in verse 3, And when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubics, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters came up to my ankle. He said that he was standing in this river that was flowing, and he was in water up to his ankle. How many of you know you have to, to, to even get wet, you got to get started. Get into the water. Step into the water. There's a lot of folks that are afraid to go on with God because they won't step into the water. they got to start by stepping into the water. He's ankle deep now. And I witnessed this one time when Pastor Holmes William and I, and Williams and I was doing a crusade in, in, in Dominica, and it was on a Sunday night. 
And on that Sunday night, it rained 36, it rained 26 times. We counted these outbursts as rain. Uh, the cricket field was just full. People were standing room only. The cricket field was full. Every time it would rain, everybody would put their umbrella up. You imagine 12,000 umbrellas all going up at the same time. It was a sea of umbrellas. The rain came so hard 26 times that the cricket field was flooded. People were standing in the cricket field up to their ankles in water and not one person left the field because the anointing of God was so strong. They was ankle deep. Are you with me? This vision was Ezekiel was in the temple. Water was flowing out the side from the altar. How many of you know the altar is where the anointing is? The water was flowing from the altar, from the throne room of God, through the altar, out the right, 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 right side of the, of, the, of, the, of the tabernacle. And he was ankle deep in water. And again, in verse 4, the measuring, oh, they measured 1,000 and, uh, and, and brought me through the water, and the water came up to my knees. Now he's ankle deep, and now he's knee deep. How many of you know if you're knee deep, uh, you have a little more buoyancy, a little more effectiveness to do some things, but you still are standing in your own power. Is anybody with me so far? And again, in verse 5, he measured 1,000, and it was a river uh, that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, and water in which one must swim. A river that could not be crossed. Now all of a sudden, he's standing knee deep in water that he can't walk across. He's got to get into the flow of the, uh, of the river. The river is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He has to get into the flow. He has to quit relying on himself. He can't stand under his own power and his own strength. He's got to yield himself to the things of God, and he has to get in there and start to swim. Is anybody getting the picture so far? Verse 6, he said to me, Son of man... Have you seen this? Have you seen this? The Spirit of the Lord is revealing this revelation to him, and then he's checking him, and I'm going to ask you this morning, are you seeing this? You see, we need to see revelation. We need to see the vision. We need to see what God's saying in the spirit realm. Uh, we're so used to seeing everything in the natural that when the spirit starts to move, uh, we're not sure what God's doing. The church today is being desensitized to the flow of the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God starts to flow, we need to be able to know it. Verse 7. When I returned there alone, the, uh, when I returned there along the bank of the river, uh, uh, were very many trees on one side and then on the other. Verse 8. Then he said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region. It goes down into the valley and enters into the sea. And when it reaches the sea, it's water that heals. There was healing water. You know what the river was? It was fresh water. It wasn't salty. It wasn't salt and salted down. It wasn't the kind of water you can't drink. You can't, how many of you know you can't drink seawater? John knows all about water. That's what he does. He's a, he's, a water, uh, he, he, he's a water perfectionist. He knows all about water. And you can't drink salt water, can you, John? Well, I tell you what, these people that get stranded out in the sea, they can't keep drinking it without dying. The salt will eventually, eventually uh, cause them to have cramps and it will eventually lock up your digestive system because salt water is not, what it, 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 it is not what is life. Life is in fresh water. And he said the fresh water was flowing. It became healing. And it shall be that every, every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, it will live. You see, if we're going to live and we're going to walk in the anointing, we need to get in the flow of the river. Is anybody with me? And it says, There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. Hallelujah. Amen. Then if you'll look forward a little bit to chapter 11 of Ezekiel 47. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They would be given over to salt. Anybody seeing that? In other words, we have to stay in the main stream of God's flow, church. We have to find the main flow and stay in it. 
And you can't say, well, this is good enough for me. I'll just go ankle deep as long as I have control of myself. As long as I don't have to, I have to be controlled by anything, I, I've got control. Ankle deep's good. Then there's those that will that'll go in as far as their knees, knee deep, and they'll say, hey, well, the, the, the river pushes me a little bit, but I still got control of what I'm doing. But God is saying in this day, are you willing to release yourself, get into the deep water to where the flow of the anointing will carry you wherever God wants you to go and the power of God will flow you and God will take care of you and you'll walk in the strength and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, along the banks of the river on this side and that, there will grow all kinds of trees used for food, and their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. And they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Somebody tell me where it flows from. The sanctuary. It flows from where the anointing is. It flows from the throne room of God. It flows through the places where God's people gather for strength and for anointing and will feel his presence. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for medicine. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody's going to get this about midnight. That's the reason why I like that song. There's a river of life. Give me a D. Give me a D quick. Somebody. A D. I know you're waiting for an F. I'll take a D this day. Listen. Listen to the words of this song. The words of this song tell us about that. There's a river of life that's flowing out out from me. Well, it makes the lame to walk oh, in the blind oh, Captives, captives free. Where well, there's a river of life, and it's flowing out, flowing out from me. A river of life, a river of life, a river of life. There's a river. Let me, let me ask you this. Are you ready to shift in the second gear? Is anybody willing to say, well, I've been running along in first gear for a long time, and I'm hearing the voice of God saying, shift, 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 shift. And you're going to hit that, and you're going to push that clutch in, and you're going to hit that shift right now, and you're going to go into second gear, and the engine's going to quiet down, and you're going to pick up speed. And we need to shift into second gear. Is the problem with the church today, are we using Moses' model for a Joshua age? I'm going to give you just a few nuggets that I picked up. And if you want to write these down, they're going to be just, uh, they're going to be just little things that will stay in your spirit. Or are we using the prophet's model for a Jesus age? Are we still living where the prophets prophesied in the Old Testament? Are we going to walk into the new revelation that Jesus had and he walked under the anointing of God and he, the power moved and the glory fell and, and the presence of God filled the place. The river of God flows out of the throne room of God. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Mm -hmm. What do you think about this statistic? One third. 33% of the adults in our nation are not affiliated with any church. That's 33 million people. Anybody hear me? 33 million people are not affiliated. Adults are not affiliated with any kind of church. This started in 1990 until 2014, and the church hasn't noticed. We're still going through the same things that we always did. We're still doing the same stuff, and we, we, and, 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 and we think it's all going to pan out. We think they're going to leave and maybe come back whenever they get lonely for the things of God, but they're not coming back. I believe uh, what good is our buildings and what good is our sermons if no one's there to hear them. That's a quote. I said, what good's our sermons and what good is our fancy buildings? 
if there isn't anybody to hear them. Because the adult generation and the, uh, the, the next generation of young adults have decided uh, that, uh, that there were so many don'ts that they had to hear and there were so many things we told them they couldn't do that down inside of them there was, they had a desire to do some stuff. So uh, they thought, well, rather than be hypocrites, I'm just going to go leave the church. And that's what's happened. People need to hear the things that we can do. People need to have the alternative to things that they would like to do uh, because of the flesh. But we, uh, we can still have a good time. We can still enjoy the Lord. And we, and we don't have to preach don'ts all the time. Do you know that there's more? Listen, I talked to somebody this last week. In fact, two people. Uh, there's more. It's going to be a surprise to you that there's more suicides among pastors than ever before. Anybody hear that? There's more suicides among pastors than ever before because of the pressures of ministry, because of the pressures of failure, because things that they poured their whole life into and, and, and gave their life for, uh, those people that they poured themselves into has just, uh, without even thinking about us, walked out and left, and pastors are committing suicide. Do we want our traditions to do what they've always done, or do we want to be effective? How many of you know traditions is okay? Jesus walked in the traditions of the church. Traditions are okay, but it didn't stop there. We can't stop with our traditions. We need to go on and press through and say, Lord, if there's a shift, if I need to shift into second gear to win this, uh, this generation, if I need to shift into second gear to show the world that Jesus loves them, then I'm going to shift. Is anybody with me so far? I'm convinced that nothing will hum humble us like failure. I said, nothing will humble you like failure. Now, I can, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I'm sure there's at least one or two of us that's had a few failures in our life. I'm sure there's one or two of us uh, that things that we thought was going to turn out right didn't. And things that we thought we could do, uh, we couldn't. And things that we put our life into uh, it seemed like uh, they didn't turn out like we thought. And, 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 and it didn't make us feel good. And it didn't make us feel proud. And we didn't go around and tell everybody how good our failure was. Because failure will humble you like nothing else. And I see some areas of failure in the church today. I see some areas where, uh, where the very ones that we need to grab onto and the ones we need to witness to and the ones we need to share with aren't listening. Maybe we're trying to change people and God wants to let people change us. Anybody get that? Maybe we're trying to change people. Maybe we're trying to bring everybody in to adjust to the way we think. We want everybody to come adjust to the way we feel. We want everybody to come in and, and adjust to what we like. And maybe God's saying, have you ever thought about adjusting the way they feel and what they like? To get them to change their attitude towards who God is and know that God loves them for whoever they are. I believe relationship is the key. Church, I believe relationship is the key. Good communications is not what's being said, but it's what's being heard. Anybody hear me? I said good communication is not what's being said. I've heard some incredible teachers in Bible college, and I've heard some incredible teachers uh, deliver stuff and, and, and their approach and the things that they say, and they talk so deep, I wasn't getting it. They might have been excellent teachers, but if, but if you're not hearing in, in the realm of receiving, then it's not good teaching. If we build the people, the people will build the church. If we build people up, if we care about them, We've got some visitors in the house, and God bless you back there. Thank you for uh, coming to Faith Outreach Center. Uh, but it's our responsibility as a church to love them and let them know that we appreciate them coming here. Uh, they got churches all over the city of Tampa that they could go to. Good churches. Good pastors. Men of God that I've known for 30 years and sat and had and been prayed with and wept with. So when somebody comes in, we have to believe God has brought them into the house. And we need to be the ones that say, yes, I'm going to love you. I'm going to care for you. I want relationship with you. And God will build them. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Shift into second gear. Make some changes. Do something different. 
Gloria shared, she's not here, she's ever with the children. But Jack and Gloria, Gloria shared with me yesterday, called me on the phone yesterday. I could hear her, I could hear the joy in her heart, and I could hear her weeping at the same time. She said, Pastor, I just have to call you. She said, just a little bit ago, she said, Jehovah Witnesses came and knocked on my door at the house, and I was home. And said, you always tell about uh, the problem with Christians is we're door slammers and, and curtain pullers. We shut the light off. We run back to the rest of the, to the bathroom. We uh, peek out the blind till they're gone. And that might be funny, but you know why we do it? Because we don't feel like we got the goods. We don't feel like we could, uh, that, that we know as much as they do. So we'd rather go hide. God's, and, and Gloria said, Pastor, I remembered you saying that. I remembered you saying how we need the word in us so we can confront these things. And, 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 and Pastor, I, I went to the door, and I didn't uh, turn the lights off, and I didn't run to the, uh, to the bedroom and look out the curtain. I boldly opened the door. I said, would you all like to come in? And she said, Pastor, I invited them in. She said, and I told them what I heard you say many times. I'll give you 10 minutes to tell me what you believe and if you'll give me 10 to tell you what I believe. Amen. And she said, those people came and they sat down in my living room. And she said, I had a chance after they told me uh, what uh, the Watchtower uh, teaches. I told her what Jesus teaches and that we serve the almighty God and there's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ and he is the Lord of all and he's master and king and she said they had ears to hear Ooh. hallelujah oh listen church we need to be bold we need to shift into second gear when it comes to some of the things that we used to do and she was so excited because uh, they left and they shook hands and, and uh, they, they didn't throw their Watchtower uh, magazines into the trash and, and pray the sinner's prayer. They didn't do that. But you know what they said? They said to Gloria, said, I want to tell you something. It's so refreshing to know that there, you guys are all, you claim to be Christians. And when, when, whenever we knock on someone's door, uh, they hide from us. We know they're in there. They said when we go knock on their door, uh, they, they always say they're too busy. All we want is the courtesy to share a few minutes with you, and, and we're welcome to hear what you have to say, and you gave us that honor and that courtesy. How are we going to win the world unless we shift into second gear about our mindset and our thinking? Is anybody with me so far? Listen, many times, and, I, and I'm just sharing some things that I picked up in the conference, many times, it's not Satan uh, that is attacking us, but God's trying to shift us. We're blaming the devil. The devil does this. The devil does that. Oh, the devil's on my back today. I wonder if maybe it's God himself trying to shake us where we can, uh, where we can get out of first gear and we can get into another uh, thought pattern and we can stop and think about a different way that we approach people and we can uh, look at the river that's flowing out of the throne room of God and get into the flow and say, God, move me wherever you want to move me. Water to swim in, not just ankle deep and not just knee deep. I think God's doing something fresh, church. I think God wants us to get our mindset. Did God have a shift for Israel, the early church? He certainly did. Acts 8.1 or Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8, Jesus is in heaven. He told the disciples, tarry in Jerusalem till the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the other most parts of the world. And they did that, and they waited. 120 in the upper room awaited for 10 days for the outpouring of God, and the glory fell that morning. And it was 9 o'clock in the morning, the Holy Ghost fell. Cloven tongues of fire came across those, uh, those 120. All that were in Jerusalem that gathered from all over and from all over the other regions were there. They heard the power of God. They heard them praying, speaking in tongues. They saw the cloven tongues of fire. Peter got up and preached, and 3,000 got saved. In Acts 2, 42, it said they all gathered together in, in houses. They went from house to house breaking bread together and, and receiving the apostles' doctrine. And those that had sold and they gave it to those that didn't have because they were the body of Christ meeting each other's need. How many of you know that sounds good? How many of you know that was good? That was first gear. The church was in first gear. The church was starting out. They was revving the engines. They was moving forward. God was trying to speak. But they stayed in first gear for eight chapters. 
for eight chapters, they stayed in first gear. Finally, God said, and finally the scripture said in, in Acts 8, 1, that great persecution came upon the church and they were scattered to Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea. They start preaching what they was, they thought they could just sit around us for no more. Now let's have our nice little socials. Let's gather in our home groups. Let's gather in the synagogue and, 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 and let's have a glory, glory time. But God said he wanted them to shift into second gear and get out there and touch the world with what they have became a time of shift are we speaking the language that the next generation understands I wonder if the same cases that we need to stop the same things that we need to stop entertaining ourselves I wonder if that's the case we need to stop entertaining ourselves and we need to get into the fruitful multiplication and duplication of the power of God is anybody with me the early church had to leave Acts 1-8. And they had to get into Acts 8-1. And they had to go out and they had to get strategy together to go out and share the gospel. The church, the church is the answer to the world today. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what the other religions say. I don't care what we hear on the news. The church is the answer to the problems of the world today. That's where the answer is. Jesus is the answer. You see, the church is the 12, and Jesus is, I mean, church is the 12, and the world is the 5,000. How many of you remember when Jesus took 12 and he fed the 5,000? The 5,000 5, is the world. The 5,000 is hungry. The 5,000 is waiting to be ministered to. The 5,000 is waiting to be touched. The 5,000 is waiting to be healed. And the church is the 12. We need to march into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from us. Is there anybody here that's had anything taken from you uh, since you've been saved? Has anybody felt the enemy has stole some finances from you and stole from joy from you and, and robbed you from some of the victory in your home that you knew that in the beginning it was going to be well, but then the devil came in and, 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 and stole from you. It's time for us to go in the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from us. Is anybody hearing me? We need to find the trigger point. We need to find the trigger point to what changes the world. We need to find the place that makes the difference. We need to find the soft spot of the world so we can tap into that. Has anybody ever, ever watch those swamp people, those guys that are hunting for gators? Me and Joe, we, we, we like that kind of stuff. The rest of you probably don't. But here's the key. Uh, to, uh, to kill a gator, there's one little spot on the top of their head that you have to hit it. If you don't hit it there, it bounces off. It's too, uh, the shells, too, uh, the, uh, the skull is too, uh, too hard, and the, and, and the skin is too hard. you gotta hit that, You got to hit that soft spot. And I think what we need to do, we need to find the soft spot to touch the world with. We need to find the soft spot to tap into their emotions. We need to find the soft spot that says, I want to touch you, and I want to heal you, and I want to see God move in your life. Because the world's got a big callus all around them. The world's been hurt so much by so many people, they don't let anybody in hardly. But if we find the right spot, I said if we find the right spot, we can get in. Can I hear an amen? We need to find a trigger spot. The snakes can't bite or kill you as long as you have a purpose, as long as you have something driving you. Remember Paul back in Acts 27 when, uh, when he was shipwrecked because of that great stormy rock that, uh, that, uh, that destroyed the ship and Paul had a revelation from God. He said, the ship's going to be destroyed, be destroyed but not one of you is going to lose your life. And in the midst of the storm, they threw off all the, uh, all the cargo and, and they lightened the ship and they, uh, they threw anchors out and the anchors didn't hold and finally it run, a, run aground into the rocks. The ship was destroyed, and they found themselves on an island. Not one was killed. And so Paul goes pouring down rain. He's wet. He's cold. He goes, and they, and they build a fire, and he starts picking up sticks. And as he picks up sticks, this deadly serpent reaches over and grabs him by the arm. What did Paul do? He shook it off. He shook it off. He shook the serpent off. And I want, you, I want you to know as long as we're walking in the anointing and we know who we are in him and we're after the heart of God, we can shake off those snakes that try to bite us. 
We can shake off those serpents that try to derail us. We can shake off the things of the devil because we walk in the anointing. I'm going to give you a few things real quick. You can write this down, and I'll probably maybe pick this up next week, but I want to share with you what, what, what happened when Ezekiel had this vision. First of all, he saw a river. Somebody say a river. He saw a river. He saw a river, and he saw its source. You know where the source was? It was from the throne room of God. The river flowed out of the throne room of God. And you know, there wasn't any, any tributaries that were feeding in. Uh, it was a solid river. It didn't have any uh, feed in from this, uh, from, from, from this stream and that stream. Someone told me one time that the Mississippi River, the Mississippi River at the starting point of the Mississippi River is only three foot wide. By the time it flows down through the countries, by the time it goes through the states, it gets wider and wider and wider until it's a big, big river uh, that, uh, that the, the main ships go up and down and the, and, and, the, and the barges go up and down and they haul fuel up and down because it's got so big. You know why? Because running off the mountains and running off the, uh, from, from other states, there's other rivers that feed into the Mississippi River. But this river, it don't have all these tributaries. It flows from the throne room of God. It's a healing river. And it's on course. And it's the very force that brings the anointing. It had, it, it had a stream that was flowing that was pure and it was healing and it was power. And it caused the anointing of God to flow. There's a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk. Makes the blind to see. It opens prison doors. It sets the captives free. There's a river. There's a river. It's flowing out of me. Where does it come from? The throne room of God. And you know what? I've learned a long time ago that as long as I want to stand ankle deep, I have a little touch of the Lord, and I have, I, I have him touching me as the water goes by, but I'm still on my own power. And when I get in knee deep, it'll rock me a little bit. Has anybody ever got to the edge of the, uh, of the uh, Gulf of Mexico or, or the Atlantic Ocean and those waves are rolling in and when you just stand there ankle deep, it'll almost, it'll almost knock you over. But if you wiggle your feet, wiggle your toes, and you get down in that sand, bury your feet down about that far in that sand. When it hits you, you're just going to bounce back. Am I right? And you're still under your own power. You're still in control. But when you have to get in and swim... Now you put your total confidence in the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, guide me. Let the river flow. Take me where you want me to go. Do with me what you want me to do. Because it's a river that revives. It's a river that refreshes. It's a river that bears fruit. And it's a river that will cause anointing to flow in your life. There's a river of life. Are you willing to shift into second gear? Are you willing to be part of this church if we have to make some shifts into second gear? And God speaks to us and says, shift. I want to reach this generation uh, that's not here. I want to reach these, uh, th this next generation that's not coming to church. I want to, I I want to find the soft spot of their life so we can love them and we can bring them in and touch them and make the difference. How many, how many w w will say, Pastor, when you shift, we're shifting with you? How many of you agree there needs to be a shift in the church? Does anybody agree with that? I'm ready to hit second gear. I believe I've heard God's voice. See, when you hear God's voice, you'll know when to shift. Anybody receive anything from this this morning? Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. Would you pray for that person sitting next to you? That's my wife. I know she's saved. Not me right now. I said, would you pray for the person next to you? I'm not saying if you think they're saved or not. I'm saying pray for them. Everybody could use a prayer right now. And here's what, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray that they're willing to shift when they hear the voice of God. Help me shift. Don't stay stuck in first gear all of my life because of traditions, because of what I've been taught, because of what feels good, because of my comfort zone. I'm willing to shift. might not be easy, but I'm going to shift. Maybe you're here this morning and you used to serve God with all your heart you used to be in the mainstream but something hurt you and wounded you and you 
backed away. If you die, you're going to heaven. I believe that. I believe you're saved because you're under the blood. But are you getting the full benefit out of God's presence in your life? And if not, maybe you could give this pastor the privilege to pray with you. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you haven't given your heart to the Lord. Maybe you've been in religion like Nicodemus. You know all about religion, but you didn't know Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe today would be the day that you would say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I would die tonight that I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure. But I want to be sure. I want to know. I want to be sure that I know Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. i got a home in heaven. My name's written in the book. Let this be the day. If that's you and you meet either one of those two categories, you raise your hand because this pastor can pray for you. It would be my honor, my privilege to pray with you to be sure of your relationship with Christ. That's the most important thing. If that's you, raise your hand. Say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. Is there anybody who wants to be included in this prayer? I see that hand. God bless you. Somebody else, raise your hand. Say, me too, Pastor. I want to be sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. A lot of water's gone over the... Uh, the spillway there's been a lot of things that's happened in my life that's taken my joy I, I, I want to be sure I want to know time's short and I don't have that long to live and I don't have that much time because I see that hand God bless you dear I see that hand is there somebody else by the uplift hand say me too pastor me too it's time to get it right it's time to get it right would you stand with me please everybody would the elders come this old-fashioned altar where the river of life flows. The water flows out of the throne room of God. And those that just raised your hand, would you step out of the aisle and meet me right here so I can put my hands and pray for you. Step by the aisle. There was two folks that raised their hand. Come and let's ask God. We're not asking you to join the church. We're not asking you to make any commitments. I'm asking for one thing. Let Jesus Christ be big in your life. Would you come? Would you come? God bless you, dear. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God good or what? God good. God bless you. pray. I'm going to ask you all to pray a prayer with me. Church, I want you to pray with them. These folks are saying, Jesus, I want to make a fresh start. I'm going to give you control of my life this morning. So let's pray. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for touching me this morning. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and make me whole. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. And I acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. And Lord, according to your word, I am saved. I got a home in heaven. I'm going to spend eternity with you. And you'll be my Lord forever. And I'm going to ask you right now, help me to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I ask that you fill my sister with your spirit. Anoint her with your power. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Fill her with the Holy Ghost and power. But Lord, that she can walk and she can move in the anointing and the presence of God. Touch her, Lord. Touch her. Lord, fill my sister with the Holy Spirit. Empower her. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Empower her with your anointing and your presence. And Lord, we thank you for it. We ask you, God, to fill her with your spirit. Father, I just ask you right now that you fill my sister with the Holy Spirit. That God, that your will might be done, your anointing might flow. And Jesus, you're the baptizer, so baptize my sister in the Holy Ghost with power, with the anointing. Flow through her like a mighty river. God, she belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask those of you if you would. Can you do that? They're going to 
going to put a Bible in your hand. Put a little bit of literature in the hand. But most of all, let you know how you're loved, okay? You'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. Give the Lord a hand. Clap. Praise Him. Just a mention of your name. If you have a need, come. If you need prayer, come. We'll be closing this service in a moment. But if you need a healing in your body, come. There's something going on in your life. You need prayer. Come and let God do, touch you and move in your life. You're like fire. Hit with your soul. Chuck and Tammy, please. you precious Oh, Jesus. Well, just some mention. Oh, well, Jesus, we're just a mention of your name. If you need prayer, come. Somebody will be here to pray with you. Flowers grow and the desert blooms again. Oh, you're like fire. Worship will bring that anointing. Worship will flow if you'll just do it. The power of God flows through worship. While you're ministering to the Lord, these people are getting their needs met. That's teamwork. That's connection. Hallelujah. You're like fire. Well, in winter more time Jesus if you have a need church come there's anointing in here there's a the presence of God is brooding is hovering over you Line. Jesus, just to mention your name, everybody. Oh, yes, well, oh, Jesus, well, just a mention of your name. Sing it again now, yes. Well, Jesus, just a mention.
Is there anybody here that's willing to shift into second gear? Is anybody here like ice cream? We're going to have ice cream tonight and all the fixings for it. I want to invite you to come 6 o'clock tonight. Not a service in the sanctuary, but my friend from Lebanon, Tennessee, Elvis Wade, tremendous singer. Tremendous gospel singer. Might even do a couple of a couple of Elvis's songs. So come and enjoy it. How many of you know we're going to do some of the things it's okay to do? The can do's. The can do's for a Christian. Give me an F. Help me with this. We'll close with it. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream surely tastes good. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream really tastes good. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream really tastes good. Oh, but Jesus is the best of all. Help me now. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream truly tastes good. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream really tastes good. I love Jesus better than ice cream, but ice cream really tastes good. Oh, but Jesus is the best of all. Turn around, look at somebody, you'll be dismissed and sing. 